There we go. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the 2023-2024 Institute for Knowledge Studies public seminar series, which is a bit of a mouthful on a, a Thursday evening. Uh, but it's lovely to see you all, and welcome to all of those joining us for the very first time. For those who don't know me, my name's Dr. Andrew Lind. I'm a lecturer here at the Institute for Northern Studies, and it's my great pleasure to be chairing these sessions. Now, as is custom, I have just a very quick few housekeeping points to make before introducing tonight's speaker. Uh, firstly, just to make everyone aware if the scary robot voice at the beginning of the session wasn't uh, a hint enough, that tonight's session is being recorded and will laterally be available on the INS YouTube channel. So if you want to relive tonight's events all from the beginning, you can do so at your leisure. The second point that I just want to point out is that you're all welcome to submit questions at any point during the presentation tonight. And what we'll do is I'll gather them up and we can address them at the Q&A after the presentation is finished. To do so, please use the chat function rather than the Q&A function on your screen. That might seem a little bit strange, but it just means if you use the chat function, we can all see it and it uh, means that none of the questions fall through any of the gaps. So just uh, pop your questions into the chat and make sure that you send them to all panelists and we'll catch them. Uh, the third and final point, which I've not to forget, I, I see written in bold in my notes, is that I'd like to do a little bit of uh, selfless uh, selfless, shameless, I should say, uh, self-promotion for INSC's upcoming summer course, which will be held at UHI Perth and is called Rulers and Raiders, Celts and Vikings in Central Scotland. This will be a residential course, which will run from the 17th to the 22nd of June, where participants will take part in excursions, lectures and workshops from Viking experts within the department. And I am reliably informed the whole thing will include a Cayley. So if you are looking for an opportunity to escape into the early medieval period, make sure that you email ins at ins at uhi.ac.uk for all inquiries and further details. Now, back to the seminar. I am very pleased tonight to introduce tonight's speaker, Adele Liddell. Adele will be a familiar face to many within UHI's research community, as she's a current PhD student here at INS. Adele's thesis explores how the Scottish Islands Plan 2019 has been received and how it has been utilised by Scotland's island councils. The research seeks to evaluate and critically analyse the developing and changing role of island-based local government and communities. So tonight, Adele is going to be sharing some of her insights and thoughts on this research with us in her paper entitled Transitions in Scottish Policy, Embracing Complexity to Support Efficacious Implementation of Progress Governance Models. Welcome, Adele. Uh, great, Andrew. Thank you very much for the introduction there. Um, and yeah, I'm going to take you through some of my kind of processes and some of the early results. So I'm at the end of my second year, just going into my third year. So I've collected some data now um, and learned some things, shall we say, about the Scottish National Islands Plan um, along the way. So um, this image and this picture, so I use this um, quite often. So this is one of the Arcadian islands of Flotta here. So um, we're not just one island, we're an archipelago, a group of islands. Um, and what you can see there is uh, the Flotta oil terminal, so oil tankers, but you'll see things like port developments, you'll see things in that image, uh, there's a helicopter there, uh, wind turbines, uh, and a smattering of houses also. So in this kind of uh, historically rich area that is Scapa Flow. So we'll, we'll talk about some of these old and new <laughs> developments um, and also how policy and governance has sort of shaped not just these developments, but how some of the developments have unlocked um, governance opportunities for the island's local authorities um, along the way. So my research questions are looking specifically into how the National Islands Plan, the Scottish National Islands Plan, translates into actions that benefit island communities. So I've got this lens immediately of what is it doing for islands? And then also a little bit about the history, which I'll talk you through this evening um, about is it a reflection of what the Isles local authorities were looking for um, during their campaign? And I'll give you a little bit about the structure of island local authorities as well, because it's quite unique um, in uh, the, the island local authorities in Scotland. Their situation is quite unique. Um, really, how the National Islands Plan may or may not be changing relationships between different organisations. Uh, and also from this community angle as well. And I'll speak a little bit about this and how 
the Scottish policy landscape, or sometimes called a polity, um, supports this kind of these ideas around uh, empowerment and well-being uh, down all the way down to individual level. Um, and then also um, we'll have some interesting <laughs> discussions about ownership and the corporate uh, uh, cooperation um, as I've um, managed to get some feedback from stakeholders who have been, you know, part and parcel of this whole process of coming up with a National Alliance plan and then delivering what it says it's going to deliver. So with that as well, so we've, I've talked through these. My plan for this presentation is um, really to look around this role of network. So I've already mentioned there we've got government, we maybe have this international remit of uh, empowerment, we have different organisations, local authorities, we have community-based organisations, we have individuals, and then we have other delivery organisations. So you might know them as quangos or second sector organisations. And then just in a presentation I was delivering yesterday, things like third sector organisations and how they are reshaping themselves around um, changing needs in communities and also austerity, <laughs> austerity measures that impact budgets and things like that. So there's this <clears throat> process of change that's happening as each organisation is, you know, moving around and making itself accessible to uh, opportunities as they arise. So things like budgets or changes in policy and things like that. So hopefully I'll speak through three different case studies um, around networks in that sense. And this also brings in this element of context, which is really important when we're speaking about islands. So um, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles have got very different personalities <laughs> from one another. And then we have a whole host of islands in Scotland as well that are uh, associated with mainland local, local authorities. And then even within our archipelagos, um, the different islands like Flotta that I showed you there, you know, they have their own personalities and their own relationships to their own centres and things like that. So it helps us make sense of some of this extremely complex, multifaceted, constantly moving um, uh, framework and constantly moving picture of the context. And then I just wanted just to um, show you this real world kind of case study. So, you know, this is not just a policy that's there on a piece of paper. I mean, it could be that, but um, really there's some what they call wicked problems or problematizations or issues um, happening on uh, on the Scottish islands at the moment where we really need to be addressing um, sustainability issues that are happening around the islands and really policy impacts everything we do, how we access budgets, the way organisations can spend their budgets, uh, even when you're thinking uh, in technical terms and developing projects you know, policy, regulation, legislation um, impacts what you can and can't do, you know, even when you're building physical assets um, out into communities as well. So it's often ignored. It can be very confusing. I hope I've introduced some of this concept of complexity, but we'll go through it um, some more. Um, so it's, and it's a constantly moving feast on top of that. So I've taken this approach of what is called a process evaluation. So the National Alliance Plan was published in 2019. We're in 2024. It's five years. However, it's quite a short amount of time if we think about a policy context. So really the likelihood of seeing impact so quickly is quite low. So then you've got to think about, well, what else is happening around the National Islands Plan? Is it doing what it said it was going to do? Is it reaching the target groups that it said it was going to reach? What areas are there for improvement? And we're actually at a point where the National Lions Plan is uh, open for redevelopment. So now is a really good intervention time to gather some of that knowledge and feed it into these next iteration, if indeed there's going to be one um, of the National Lions Plan plan there. So I'm using the Scottish Government's own kind of definition of the process evaluation and the case study in my case. So I, I was looking at splitting out the islands. I mentioned that it had different personalities, but as I've gone through the process of gathering data, there are some similarities and I'm actually using the National Islands Plan as a standalone case study. And then there's smaller case studies um, nest, nested underneath. And the case study really allows me to keep the context of what happens. And that's one thing that's extremely important as I hope I'll convey um, running you through the project tonight. So, 
sustainable rural development. That's my background. <laughs> um, that's what I did at undergrad. That's what I did my master's as an island person working in industry, working for the local authority. You know, that was always my remit. I've been really lucky to work in excellent projects, community based projects, you know, working across this idea of sustainability and in the policy, more often than not, we come across sustainable economics, sustainable economic development, which is never really that sustainable. But sustainable rural development looks at um, the environment, people and the and uh, economics, and it looks for this kind of trying to balance up more than the other. And we'll speak a little bit about market and I won't go too much into it for this project, but it's really looking at bringing this triple bottom line um, into awareness. And, you know, there's a wide history of this. So even back into the 1560s and off, even before, even in industrial times, we have written records of people sort of warning. <laughs> and then, you know, over time, the, the uh, it, it comes true. But, you know, there was this connection very early on in the 60s that, you know, we couldn't continue on with this, you know, growth um, when there was finite resources on the planet. So it's important to me that I capture this idea of sustainability in my research um, and bring it forward. And um, it does play into the National Islands plan here. So I think these uh, sustainable development goals, you know, although they've not been achieved, they're these aspirational targets. And I think it is the right thing to do. I don't always agree with splitting them out either, um, but I think it's just a nice way to visualise these sustainable development targets. And the basis of the National Lions Plan and a lot of the justice kind of policies in Scotland, community power, community empowerment policies in Scotland, um, refer into these sustainable development goals. And the local authorities all meet through this network in Scotland called COSLA, if you're not aware, and they do voluntary reporting towards Scotland's um, progress towards these sustainable developments. So there is like a neat line there of local authorities um, directly working in with these sustainable development um, principles. Um, often it was applied, you know, to communities, you know, south of the equator or what we would think about the global south, but actually in some of our, and not just rural areas and not just island areas, um, but lots of our communities uh, within urban areas as well can really benefit from some of these principles as well when we're thinking about community-based developments um, in terms of sustainability. So complexity has plagued my research throughout the last two years um, and complexity really is about context and we're looking here at this uh, in this policy vein. So what you've got is you've got a lot of diverse interacting components. So we have individuals, organisations, we've got different islands, we've got islands within islands. I'll show you um, a map I've done of policies in Scotland that just relate to the National Islands Plan. We've got all these moving feasts, we've got changing budgets, we've got general elections, we've got local elections, we've got changes of personality, uh, we've got things we've had since the National Alliance Plan was published, we've had COVID, um, we've had, um, you know, the war in Ukraine and various other things. So we have all these moving components, bits and bobs um, moving around. And we can't just ignore that, or I can't just ignore that. I think that's maybe more of my personality trait. Um, but really, now policy, particularly through like Whitehall and through Westminster, has a very different policy analysis machine. They're understanding, you know, as these networks in themselves, as islands with as di uh, diverse, complex kind of systems, you know, they are interacting over and above our own nation out into these globalised markets um, as well. So that adds this extra layer of complexity. So how do we put a handle on all these kind of rushing around uh, factors that are interacting with one another in ways that are not always um, predictable, shall we say? Um, and really, this that's why I have to look at it. This is the context that we can't really ignore, because if you're going to have an, a, an effective policy, you really need to take heed of the context that it's going out into for it to be successful. And I think about one kind of thing about complexity is this idea about systems or some form of organisation. So this kind of soft, what I think, structure around this complexity. And e even at that level, when we think about islands, so, you know, each island, each individual island, each archipelago, each organisation, you know, these kind of form a system. And I think certainly in my previous role, and I think to some extent, 
looking at this national islands plan you know the island sort of sold itself as a test lab for certain things which was good in some ways um, but it's a way of kind of it's like a islands can be sort of this container but then it opens up another conversation about you know who's benefiting from you know uh using resources and i'm talking about social resources as well as anything else but however islands are systems with these certain levels of organization so if we think about that politically in islands we have you know westminster scottish government has a remit over some decisions we make local authorities we have community um councils we have community-based organizations we have businesses you know they're all interacting in ways and i think this has really come out through my research about the nature of local economies um it's quite different on islands than it would be in urban spaces so we have to think about these systems and how they're interacting and whether the systems that we've decided are similar or different from each other and in complexity we get this idea of path dependency which can be a hindrance for change or it can be uh, a kind of clue as to what might happen next as well and it just really is this historical element of what's happened in that context before um, and I'll speak a little bit more about um, a little bit more <laughs> about the policy history of islands as we go through because the plan hasn't just popped out of nowhere but what does pop out of nowhere are emergent properties and this is another thing about complexity that we have all these warring elements around and sometimes the results pop out in ways that are unexpected <laughs> uh, and basically it's the sum of its parts kind of much um, can be much more uh, worthwhile than the, the end result can be more than the sum of its parts so we think about complexity something like the best example is you know raising a child you know the, you have a child it's got they've got their own unique personality even if you have more than one child they're going to be very different from one another and there's no predetermined way of raising that child in the right way. You just have to kind of guess it as you go along. Um, and there are some support mechanisms. Something that would be complicated would be they also use like a rocket or, you know, set, uh, advanced piece of technology. So it's different from being complicated and it's continually moving. So this has been great. So I like to just take this moment if you're able to pop something in the chat. Um, and I just wondered what your definition or what you think the function of a government should be. So I'll give you a couple of moments and then um, I'm going to see if I can see the chat from there. Uh, I don't think I can see the chat. Are you still there, Andrew? Is there anything in the chat? Yep, still there. Um, the chat should start to be populated now. If anyone, it's just to check that people are still listening. <laughs> there we go. It's in the top window. Yeah, great. So we have one comment here, so I'll just read it out for the YouTube. There we go. Act in the overall best interests of the whole area governed. Reflect the expectations of civil society to support and serve the community. Great. So yeah, quite similar to what's been popped in the chat there. I um, I like this definition and I like where it's come from. It serves a purpose for the argument in this paper as well. So the function of government should be to make life better for everybody. Um, and this is the Social Justice and Fair Fairness Commission. And we see quite a lot of these things. We have Just Transition Commission, we have Community Empowerment Acts, the Scottish Government's just passed a S Sustainable Development Bill, and um, we have um, community land ownership coming into play. So there are these elements of justice that are coming through policy generally in Scotland. I mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals before. They come through something called the National Performance Framework, which is a dashboard of indicators. Um, looking at um, development across a range of things, um, as mentioned before. So I have had to take, so normally what I would have done in previous research is I have this filter of the European Union and everything filters down to that. But with Brexit, <laughs> that's no longer the case. So what I'm looking at now is what does the government say, the Scottish government, what is it saying that it wants to do for civil society? And then how do islands play into what they say they're going to be doing? So 
Here is an excerpt from a um, participant, one of my interview interviewees. So they're from the Western Isles here. And we'll, we'll talk through this, we'll come through the details through the, the paper, but they said here that it's the local authorities and the island communities are feeling like they're asking for something exceptional from the government when really they're looking for equity and parity. So there is this element, and this has come through in some of the research, and it is politics, but there is this negotiation and this constant having to ask for more and sometimes more money, sometimes it's support for things, um, and we see things around transport, about communities trying to utilise resources. And I think it was just a really prescient point, and it's so simple, and it's always the best thing, you know, it's just reframing it you know they're not asking for special treatment in that sense they're just asking to be treated the same and then another um another person who is also in the western Isles, not related to this one but they were also stating you know that they their identity was scottish you know they feel scottish and there was this sense of sadness in the discourse there about being treated um how they felt they could be treated so poorly by this nation that it felt like it, it belonged to. So there was this quite complicated relationship that happens there uh, and this seeking of sort of equity and justice um, that comes through some of the, the interviews. So the National Islands Plan is covers, this number, by the way, is actually updated again. So uh, 93 inhabited islands. Um, the It's not all islands are 98% landmass but the rural areas in Scotland are 98 percent and then it's a rough it's just under two percent of population and interestingly I did a quick calculation and that the GVA or the gross value added the islands pay into the Scottish economy is very similar to that of its population so it's not like it's costing the government more money which is often the thing um, that, that comes down to in the argument so the islands contribute a similar value to the economy as the people that live there and I think this is a really interesting point. So this bit about an island community here, this has been defined in the Islands Act, which underpins the National Islands Plan. And I think what's very interesting is prior to the National, the Scottish Islands Act, sorry, you know, there was no need really to define what an island was, what an island community was. But now we suddenly have this piece of legislation that tells us what an island is. So there is that element then of something being held in a central location that tells you about yourself and we'll come to that um when i speak a little bit about um some of the stakeholder participation um, in the interviews as well so the islands haven't always had their own local authorities so it's around 50 years time i found some very interesting acts from 1965 which i won't go into detail here but maybe for another paper but basically um there was some redevelopment of the highlands and islands and one really important part about that redevelopment of the highlands and islands was it gave the remit for the secretary of state for scotland which is still a very powerful job in the uk and that's it, that person sits down in westminster to acquire land to develop on so we call it compulsory purchase orders if you're not aware but basically it gives power for the secretary of state to decide that they can acquisition land um, for any reason, <laughs> basically. So that was in 1965. Um, at that time, there was this uh, discussion opened that the islands could join that highland region, but there was an aversion to that. And through the Hansard Committee, they managed to avoid becoming, the islands managed to avoid becoming governmentally part of the highlands and, and islands region through Highland Council at that time. So within sort of <laughs> the islands, uh, I don't know, network, people um, implementing the National Islands Plan, the Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles have become to be known the big three. So Shetland um, in the late 60s, early 70s negotiated itself. I think it was 1974, it was ratified, this Zetland County Council Act. So what happened was there was this opportunity of Sulemvo oil field and then the Shetland Islands managed to negotiate directly with industry and then there was some governance changes that happened and there was other benefits to that so they managed to retain some income from the oil but they also managed to negotiate themselves some kind of power to retain they got their county council act they were a 
you know, became a unitary authority. Orkney Islands Council did the same in the same year, but slightly later and uh, slightly less of a good deal always when you go second. So these two local authorities were able to build themselves this nest egg um, and they already did, but it was just formalising, you know, this kind of power uh, coming from the islands in that sense. So the money from these oil in um, oil developments still sits within, well, it sits within the Orkney. Orkney Islands Council, what we call the Strategic Reserve Fund. So there's been like a rainy day fund of around 300 million and Shetland's managed to kind of explode that budget and really deliver out uh, some high level services for itself over the last few decades, uh, which is coming to an end now. And the way that it's changed that kind of governance model around the money um, has come uh, big. But not only was there money from these oil um developments, which I think was the key point, but there was this negotiation around how you could solidify some of your governance arrangements within that window of change that happened around these oil developments. And I think that we're seeing a similar point now with renewable energy developments as we come through the islands. So known as the big three, the Western Isles is, is different. So it doesn't have a County Council Act, but the Scottish Islands Act allows for the Western Isles to consider its own governance arrangements within the legal structure of what's happening there um, as well. But there are three other local authority areas, Highland Council, Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire, which also they're mainland local authorities, but they have a remit over islands. Um, I think there's this topic, one of my supervisors actually um, came up with this term so they talk about archipelagosity and I think there is this certain a critical mass that comes with being an archipelago and having this county council act these pie charts on the other side if you were to look at that for heart and shit in the west now it would be 100 percent obviously so there's this real sort of sense of like islandness um and there is you know a difference here with these local authority areas that have a remit over islands um and I think so there's been some work done, I think, around mapping sort of uh, projects around the islands and things like connectivity and, and services. And there's been this sort of splitting up of these archipelagos into different islands, because if you're not on the mainland of these islands, you can see on this map here, you see right up in Shetland, um, we have the Cyan area, Magenta one, then we have the Orkney mainland and the Outer Isles in yellow. And then we have the US North. Sorry, I shouldn't say the US. I often wondered, we hate it for anybody who's not on an island. If anybody watches Shetland, <laughs> this happens in Shetland. We don't like being called the Orkneys or the Shetlands. And I wondered if there was a Western Isles version and there is, it's the US. So uh, we have Harris um, uh, and, you know, we have the, the North and South US there split up. Um, by colour. So it's really interesting for me as an Arcadian to see the islands split up in this manner. So my husband lived in Chaffinsey. It's this tiny little yellow one just north of the middle of the Blue Orkney Islands. And service provision and standard of living across a number of different indicators, it does become a lot more challenging uh, when you're not on even that mainland. There is some sort of local discourse around if you live on the mainland part of your island, you're not an islander. It's a really strange dichotomy. So there you go. I will come on to remoteness in a moment. Um, so there needs to be something, I think, that does help equalise for these islands who don't have this critical mass of, of archipelagos. But I should say that out of the hundred and odd thousand islanders, over 70 percent and approaching 75 percent of islanders live in either Orkney, Shetland or the Western Isles. So you know, it does have a critical mass of population, of, of island populace as well um, here. Um, within the National Islands Plan, so this is a programme over five years, which we've already discussed. Uh, the budget was reduced. It's actually even reduced down to 25.8 million. The first tranches of funding were kind of in the, the crux of COVID. So it got, it got produced, it got released um, 12 weeks before COVID happened. So in one sense, there was this ability to fund island community based organisations in a very uh, astute time of crisis, shall we say. Um, and there was a really good recording of how that money was spent and what it did and what it really rattled out, I think, in that process was 
when using community-based organisations, you can't just use the ones that are there already. So the ones that were already formalised were there, and there's this risk of embedding inequality because it doesn't really take account of island areas that were not able to formalise themselves into community-based organisations. So there's pros and cons around that. Um, but it, what really ticked the local authorities off was that it wasn't they weren't in the receipt of any of that island's National Alliance Plan funding within that immediate first couple of years of the National Alliance Plan. So local authorities only started to get funding 2021 and then in 2022, 2023. And in that process, the funding was competitively tendered. So the islands had to bid in. Um, so they're in the background, there's this issue around austerity and local authorities having to justify diverting capacity away from service provision for islanders and into this kind of strategic planning and more risky practices um, and i think the auditing structure makes that quite difficult for local authorities and it's quite a change it's quite a paradigm change for local authorities not saying it hasn't been done um, but it's a different way of approaching how they deliver services um, so that was the kind of initial bits of funding there's a significant project the carbon neutral islands project so six islands were picked um, to host community um, development officers um, and do carbon audits of their islands and decide how they want to kind of take forward that uh, carbon remit. And then also this Young Islanders Network, which went through two iterations. But I think it's a great one because as well as being an islander and having to do some of these kind of governance struggles, whether, you know, there's a gender based interaction of being an islander and there's an age-based interaction of being an islander as well. So we get these kind of conflating issues, complexity that we talked about at the very beginning. Um, and the way that these programmes and projects have been evaluated is um, <clears throat> through uh, route maps, annual reports, and they did a COVID lens. So this was the Scottish government that did it. Um, and the way that communities fed into this process was um, consultation. So there was a consultation at the beginning. I mean, it was a big consultation. They visited, uh, you know, over 40 islands. Um, and the way that the decision makers fed in was there's kind of these strategic delivery groups that feed into to whatever happens. And we hear this through the islands plan, you carbon neutral islands. We've got these community groups involved. It's bottom up. But actually the funds and all the strategic direction were driven from the top down. And even when I've been asking around these kind of strategic uh, stakeholder groups, you know, while they were, while local authorities and local decision makers were able to kind of ask for things to be put on the agenda, often topics were taken, you know, from the top into communities to say, what do you think about that? Um, and they weren't too frequent and also they were quite short in time. So I think that's some of the feedback. So basically it was this consultative, consultative kind of uh, engagement rather than a bottom-up approach or even horizontally kind of um, managed in that essence. So when we look at the National Alliance Plan, this is what I'm trying to decipher, who is supposed to benefit from this National Islands Plan? Um, and this is like in the introduction bit from the Minister um, about how islanders kind of feel on the periphery. So we start to get some of this language in about peripheralization that's what I call it because I feel like it's a, a condition that's placed upon islands um, and you know here we've got this that decisions are being made from people who you know live on a mainland so we have this kind of urban rural dichotomy starting to come in this is you know page five of the national islands plan you know um, and then we have these kind of buzzwords around policy about place-based because it's obviously on an island it's not in the usual central belt um, and this kind of island governance so it sort of tells you that the national alliance plan is looking to do something to the governance and policy of of you know of what happens um, around decisions in islands and these ideas of remoteness peripheralization insular irrelevance whether we want them or not <laughs> really characterize con you just have to constantly go over it when you're an islander um, in whatever guise that you are because you're sort of viewed in a certain way but even again back into the 60s there's even in the research you know there's this kind of 
nod to the fact that actually islands have always been a bit ahead of their time and that islandness is not necessarily rooted to place because um, trade and emigration and emigration has been, um, you know, a part of Ireland's history for all time. Um, and yeah, so I really quite like this. And then we start to get into these ideas about how power is generated, the currency of po politics is power and values and these types of thing. And, you know, so in terms of that postmodernism, what we see is that these islands have these kind of micro governing relations that happen. And I mentioned that about um, local economies and how they tend to operate um, rather than these big multinational organisations. There's sort of these micro transactions that happen as local businesses, local organisations tend to kind of organise around opportunities um, as well as problems. So my participants in interview um, were speaking about remoteness here, and this was really echoed throughout um, certainly the archipelagos, the big three island local authorities when I was interviewing stakeholders there. So the National Islands Plan says the islanders Islands are great places to live, but remain challenging. I love this line, not least because of their geographical remoteness, uh, location but and remoteness. So there we have it. <laughs> I think uh, um, I was just at a talk yesterday and uh, they were saying, you know, dare you use the word remote <laughs> to describe island communities? And then I have, I think, a really good uh, quote here. Um, and this wasn't in response to the National Islands Plan. This just came up organically throughout the interview. You know, the islanders don't see themselves as remote because of what they do is quite central to them. And actually, you know, their Edinburgh and London is quite remote from me. And I think really interestingly, looking at geographical location, the islands have always been there. <laughs> they will continue to be there. So I'm not sure how legitimate it is an argument for not governing <laughs> in ways that are equitable um, when you know that they're always going to be in that location. So there is this element of like, some reason still being surprising that you have islands um, associated with the landmass and it's very difficult and even I fall into that trap of not comparing yourself to a mainland um, I think this comes out through islandness um, literature as well that it's legitimate enough to consider your island <laughs> off its own terms um, as well but you do fall into that trap um, of comparing it to this mainland alternative um, quite often so the National Islands Plan and the Islands Act, you know, these were a direct result of an island based bottom up campaign uh, called Ireland's Our Future, which was run by Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles Councils in 2013. And they opened this, uh, they, they recognised there was a window for change. So often when you're looking to change policy, you're looking for these interruption points that um, that mean there's going to be a legislative change so then if you're opportunistic and you're well planned enough that you can sometimes use these moments so often it's a general election but in covid we saw things like the covid emergency powers act that had such a wide-reaching influence on policy throughout the uk food standards uh, medical standards um you know schools schooling so it really had a massive impact across the whole layer of a public policy making. So there are these moments that are not general elections, but generally there needs to be some sort of change rather than just sort of halfway through a government term saying we want this. So the Island Ireland's Our Future was really good at navigating its asks uh, through that window of opportunity. And it was navigated. So um, in King Don's research about the multi-streams approach, what they're really looking for is what they call a policy entrepreneur. And the way I see that is somebody to guide that opportunity through the window and the Orkney Shetland and the Western Isles Councils through our, our future campaign were that policy entrepreneur. And they were asking for certain things, island proofing, which was a concept that had been picked up through rural uh, policy through 2000-ish in the UK. More decision-making functions around marine resources, uh, energy growth. So this wasn't just green energy, if you think about the times and this uh, path dependency for oil development. So that still burbles along in the islands as well. But it was also looking for this uh, keeping its constitutional status. And I think I'm not sure, but being an islander, just picking up on the narrative, there's constantly and even two weeks ago on the national news, there's this constant 
chat of rolling the islands into one local authority area and having like a single representative. So I think there is this kind of, I don't know, seed in the psyche of local authorities where you don't want to be rolled in together. And we've got the County Council Acts and, you know, through the Island Scotland Act, there's this remit, this legal requirement for these local authorities to remain situational as they are in that circumstance. But it still crops up every so often um, about, you know, efficiency rolling these together um rather than having you know separate ones out so i think that was part of why this constitutional part is so important rather than necessarily and there is an argument for it not necessarily full autonomy i mean it could be um but it, it's not just that i think it's this ability to retain um how you decide about how things are going to happen around you and then also other uh, economic well-being kind of drivers as well and then what we ended up with was the Island Scotland Act, the National Islands Plan, uh, changes to the Community Empowerment Act. We've had changes to the Crown Estate Act. So there is functions there in law for local authorities to ask, request, uh, demand um, more control over um, the seabed um, and also to kind of work out new, uh, more to ask for more power. So things like single authority models, which... Oh, it's, you know, path dependency part again, how things kind of used to be managed rather than we have police and fire services now and health services being managed in a central location on the Scottish mainland away from islands. But it didn't used to be like that. And I think they're looking to kind of go back to or redevelop how they can um, manage these services uh, more locally. And they have real impacts for people living uh, on the islands as well. Um, and just a little timeline. So it doesn't come out of nowhere. So we talked about, you know, this Highland Develop Highlands and Islands Development Act, County Council Act, our our islands, our future campaigns. Um, and we have this timeline of policy changes. And really, this policy is incremental, small changes here and there stacking up on top of each other rather than anything too out there. So in the fabric of the National Islands Plan, there's 13 strategic outcomes. Really interestingly, in my research, when I've asked decision makers and also people who are kind of dealing with the outcomes of these policy decisions uh, directly in the community, nobody can add or nobody wants to take away from these strategic outcomes. But we'll see in the narrative that people think there are too many <laughs> as well. But if you think back to the idea of complexity from the very beginning, and when we're monitoring these 13 strategic outcomes, I should say there are things like population levels, development, transport, housing, um, all the things you might expect, climate change um, and things like that. Um, but there's 113 commitments. These are drawn up by the Scottish Government to decide how they're going to do the 13 outcomes. And I think even immediately when you times 113 by 13 by 93 inhabited islands, I mean, how could you not consider complexity in, in how you solve um, how any of this is kind of done? So, again, um, there's these documents that come out once a year that say how they're getting on. And rather frustratingly, from my point of view, they, they've changed format almost every year. So it's quite difficult to actually track what's happened and what hasn't happened through these 113 commitments um, there. So it's kind of what and who and why and when and how long it's going to take. Um, them to do that but it does say at the very beginning of the National Alliance Plan um, that you know it needs to be done within this five-year window but then we sort of see things like a long time scale which don't really match up with what's said is going to happen and the way that these are assessed through government in Scotland are through island community impact assessments so there's a legal requirement for the government to do this there's a legal requirement for local authorities to do island community impact assessments even island local authorities <laughs> or only island local authorities um, and this is this idea of reviewing policies and making sure that they're island proofed we'll see <laughs> through this so um yeah there's some nice new leaflets about island proofing you can watch our youtube video <laughs> show that, um civil servants how to island proof i think the main takeaway is that they're not done by islanders for one uh, I was speaking about this in a, a cross-party group yesterday and <clears throat> I think 
there's uh wales have got a future generations act so anybody who's into sustainable development things like this you know that's really an exemplar of policy making um, in terms of sustainability but they do have a commissioner also who looks at all policies through that lens of this future generations act so it's not something like that we don't have an islands commissioner <laughs> looking through these actions and looking through these policies to say are they fit for islands and nor do they go to islands for that either i mean it could be happenstance that an islander would you know look at it um about what we've seen is a hundred icias and i must say there were hardly any until the last six months and it really has blossomed it uh, bloomed out from there as them you know the civil servants get used to having to do these uh, under an official scrutiny, which is publicly available to watch also, um, around 20% of the National Alliance Plan's deliverables had been delivered about this time last year, so not that many, but it's not really that surprising given the complexity of the National Alliance Plan and the issues that it's trying to address. You know, they're not simple things, if I'm throwing a bone out here for the, for the National Alliance Plan. Um, but what has happened is there's been this sort of moving or movement or, I don't know, re-enlivening of, of networks around these interest points of the National Islands Plan. I like to just keep an eye on some of the other narratives that are coming through the kind of wider policy network in Scotland as well. And throughout some of my field work too, this re... Uh, this, uh, this kind of narrative that islanders and island-based organizations need to look to the market to address gaps in service provision and provide match funding and i'll go into that a little bit because what we actually see quite often in islands is we get rural market failure where we you know where we fail to have this scale of population that make marketized solutions <laughs> impossible to kind of you know, and, and arguably they've sort of created a lot of the issues. So I don't know how we could use those to solve some of the issues either. So I think there's this kind of mismatch of what the solution needs to be and what they think it's going to be. And I did have this concern a little bit as well as to whether things like the National Alliance Plan are sort of a signal to market as well, as we'll sort of discuss the types of resources that may be available that are valuable. Um, in which they discussed in our, in our future about having this ability to control who's using what um, in that sense. And, you know, we've seen things like Rosebank have its permit um, and that's, you know, off the coast of Shetland. So, you know, there are big decisions being made around islands and, you know, this plan should really be a point where islands are supported to get the benefits of these, um, you know, these kind of nationally significant projects and they are actually called nationally significant in planning terms as well so I think it hasn't addressed those issues and I think that's really where the root of what could help islands better so we can talk through that so <laughs> had a little play around with this excellent software so CCAN do loads of great work around complexity and they've come up with this kind of tool and this can be really used when we're, we're when you're working in multiple numbers but this is just me so this is me mapping out the 13 strategic objectives of the National Islands Plan of, as to how, how I think each plan, each item interplays with each other. So I did have feedback from the stakeholders that I interviewed saying that, you know, if we want to address population levels, well, we need housing. And if you want to have housing, you need jobs. And if you're going to get people to the island, well, we need to sort out transport. So I had a little play around with how each one feeds into the other. And then I also fed in uh, the top right there you can see the Scottish Government and then at the bottom right you see local authorities there and I didn't put in all the stakeholders because it would become a lot more complex <laughs> and difficult to view on 2D as well. So that's just a way of visualising something that happens in my head. That's what a model is here, that's my model. So you see kind of in the middle to the left you have this population levels and that's really like number one and that's often what's mooted as the kind of problem that happens on islands and we do and it is a problem of this depopulation however there's no st strategic number there's no indication that there's a critical number that's required um, and what would be a healthy population level so there's not actually an aspiration in that sense of how many people and by what time what date or anything like that so it's just this kind of i don't know not a uh, 
target that's based on this need to kind of get the critical mass up in islands. And I think it is fair to do that. But especially speaking to Shetland, they are quite comfortable discussing like natural population fluctuations over time. And we have kind of seen that when we go back to path dependency again, um, how industry can impact populations in that way. But there are other islands who have managed to increase population like Oland, um, and the pharaohs and things like that. So we have seen that islands can significantly repopulate themselves and, and become, you know, great sustainable places. So you can sort of see the map there. We have the Scottish government, we have local authorities. So then what I can do with this model is kind of query what are the kind of leverage points and what are the central issues um, based on how many connections I've plugged in. So this entirely based based off the first map. So this one's looking at centrality and that's what issues are kind of at the heart um, and more important, not more important, but have more connections than the other ones. So you can see here, local authorities are quite large. My area just above local authorities there, implementation is quite large, population levels is quite large. And then you see these things <clears throat> like climate change, excuse me, and transport and the Scottish Government up there on the top right. <coughs> and quite central to all this, you'll see the uh, Island Scotland Act. And then when I think, so this is what's central to this unpicking this puzzle. And then when you look at leverage, well, local authorities shrink right down there. <laughs> and the Scottish Government uh, kind of balloons itself out. Um, so <clears throat> you see their population as well has got a lower leverage. So that's this kind of helps you pick out intervention points. And I'll go on to discuss the local authorities one a little bit more. But you see how population was such a big issue, but solving the population trap maybe doesn't lie with directly addressing um, population in, in conventional ways. But <coughs> because you need to have the supporting infrastructure there for people to be able to stay when they get here. And this is where the research or what I like to think is we all want our research to be useful. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, as an island researcher, researching islands and researching my own island, you know, you want it to be useful and you want it to kind of be reflective, but, you know, offer in some kind of level of, well, how can we utilise this tool of the National Islands Plan and these laws and acts and uh, opportunities to redress these kind of power issues. <coughs> So that's where the kind of research then becomes this praxis point. So yes, it's knowledge and yes, it's building knowledge, but it's also out in communities doing things um, as well. And this kind of feeds back into uh, my methods here. So my main way of investigating the National Alliance Plan was semi-structured interviews. So I've done 41 interviews across the different islands with stakeholders that have been involved um, and some who have not been that involved in the decision making as well to kind of find out how they found that policy process. And also, hopefully, as we come into this kind of new iteration of the National Alliance Plan, how we can use this to kind of uh, impact how the new plan um, moves forward. So again, on this networks vein, <laughs> that gets really, um, I love working like this. So at the very beginning of my project, I just mapped out stakeholders, and it's quite used to what I'm doing um, in my previous projects before. You know, I worked on projects where we had maybe 14 um, equal project partners and then you were off out into communities and having to do things with other organisations as well. So the networks become really big, really quickly and the way that you traverse yourself around different points on a network. So often we'll call those agents or whatever in networking language, but the way you traverse through these really impacts how you can deliver things and how you can increase efficiency. Um, but it's not something that you often do, you know, you don't think about it too much. It quite happens quite organically, but we see this with the way that communities materialise around um, problems and the way they materialise around uh, opportunities. It happens much in the same way as that. So really, and this is this idea of governance and these, um, what McCall was discussing in that previous slide about micro transactions in between. So this diagram has not only shaped who I've interviewed, but also I've been able to add organisations that were missing. And even yesterday I added another one in. So it's not really a finished 
thing, but it's also been quite a useful thing to see who's involved and who's been at the heart um, of that decision making and as it kind of was as it was I was expecting um, from like my previous knowledge of who's embedded in communities and who does what already embedded in island communities as the government islands team sort of come in and try to make use of that network. So it's been really useful in a number of ways, um, but it also constitutes this network of community network um, as well. So I talked about governance and none of the terms, luckily for me in my project are defined. They're all constructed here. So we have this move from this hierarchical government to a governance model um, where it's not just this hierarchical, you will do this and here's how you're gonna do it. There's actually a lot more negotiation that happens in terms of how we <laughs> govern ourselves here. And I must say that it's not always altruistic. So I think in sustainable development, we just also think like the community being involved, that's great. But I already mentioned how we can embed uh, inequalities by, you know, not doing appropriate gap analysis in communities there. But it's also a way that governments can shirk accountability, shall we say, um, and they can sort of traverse themselves up and down market structure so they can sort of kind of act less like a government and more like a private enterprise. But it's also a way of saying, well, you're responsible for this, go and do it type of thing. So there's pros and there's cons. But what I've consistently seen through this is that people want to be involved in the decision making and they feel, islanders feel like they'll get better decisions um, if they're more involved in doing it here. So um, yeah, individual interactions uh, extending beyond institutions that you would normally consider to be part of the government. And I think, well, does that not really describe communities? Um, so Foucault took on this term and took governmentality kind of um, out there, <laughs> further away from government and into this kind of idea of how we think about how we interact with one another. And then also where I talked about rural market failure and I talked about market solving problems, and that's very much the kind of tool of Westminster and, you know, Western governments. Uh, but what Ireland saw during Europeanisation and, and with Labour governments, this kind of modernisation, uh, giving local authorities more power, you know, we saw this move to governance as local authorities in the whole of the UK made more decisions in that way. But actually governance has become a kind of rival to markets. And I think we have this conflict of, you know, of those two things happening. And that's maybe where that narrative sort of comes. I'm just aware of time here. I'm just getting to the good networking bit. So hopefully I've got five minutes more. Um, this was the a case study that was done about 10 years ago on the role of local authorities in uh, developing market solutions to issues. And really, they were just kind of this conduit and a, a kind of way to kind of plug a budget gap rather than a significant sort of decision maker in that process. Um, this kind of facilitation role. I've already spoken about this signal to private investors. Um, you know, so there's decisions being made and island infrastructures, island institutions are being utilised to kind of open up the market to these opportunities of oil and renewables. But how do we ensure that islands can retain? If they were able to retain a little bit more of these benefits, could they not then support themselves where there's this kind of just deficit um, in the decision making? Um, but I also just said, you know, the community empowerment, yes, it can be good, but also it can be bad <laughs> for reasons there, including a responsibility, um, but also it has this kind of ability for governance, governments to do things that they probably couldn't do under the rules beforehand. So in our and our future, I've kind of typed that as a, co a cooperative governance model. There was this huge building of social capital focused around shared problems. They prioritised what they wanted to do. They created the capacity by creating this strategic approach and utilised the staff time within local authorities. The leverage was European um, articles, which they also fed into. It wasn't just something that happened. They actually had shaped those um, before they became um, policies. And I was saying that the legitimacy comes from within. So there's this high level of legitimacy because 
the local authorities have been involved in that. They're co-creating the strategies. They're coming up with these solutions. Um, and that worked really well for the islands there. So we have two different participants who are around at that are and our futures time. And really it came down to this bridging capital, the social capital that they were, they got on well with each other. They built this trust, mutual trust, and they decided what was common amongst the islands and what they were going to take forward. And um, looking into the strategic approach, I mean, it really was great. And um, 10 years down the line, quite a lot of what they uh, envisioned has come to pass there. So um, that's just an idea of their timeline um, and how they managed to leverage what they did. There was also some unique kind of uh, political situations around that, which were which they made really good use of there. So looking at the National Islands Plan then, I've typed that as the centralised governance model. It's technocratic, it's a plan for ministers to deliver, it's been delivered from within kind of a government uh, sex section, um, that they have sort of utilised island um, capacity there. They've used things like budgets and um, leverage tools such as legal mechanisms, the island's community impact assessments, and things like that to kind of leverage power. I also say that it is the government, so it kind of creates its own remit to do things also. Um, but the legitimacy from an island's lens is that it's, you know, exogenous. It comes from the outside. And um, there's these things like enforced competitive funding models and decision makers weren't able to kind of penetrate that process in the way that they wanted to do so. So in that sense that people just didn't really engage with it, the decision makers didn't engage with it, and therefore the legitimacy of that model kind of decreased as a result of that. Um, there. So there's the commentary around the strategic objectives. There's too many, they're too vague. Uh, this stuff would have happened anyway without the National Islands Plan. And that was a comment that came across throughout all the, the different island local authorities, um, with the exception of North Ayrshire in that sense. But, you know, um, that's just what the decision maker said, again, from the Western Isles. Um, you know, we'd been doing that work anyway. It's in, uh, This came out through Shetland and the Western Isles. Um, I think it's important for people to remember about islands, but we don't need to remember about islands. So you can see there's this sense of like it doesn't belong to them. Um, you know, they'll take the budget, but they haven't really got this sense of that they've been involved um, in doing so. So harnessing the complexity of the policy landscape, I mentioned incrementalism and all these plans. There's more. There's more plans. Even like last week, <laughs> there came another one that needs to be added to this. But this is how I kind of think about it uh, in my mind about all the different things that have played into the, the the development of the National Islands Plan. So it's not just one plan and one act. You know, there's all these con like, uh, legislative things, ideas, things like the Sustainable Development Goals that are not policy or voluntary, but that kind of form these ideas that end up being something like the National Islands Plan. And it works on the way out as well, that if you would need to leave or something, you can kind of go back to one of these other bills. And I think, you know, it takes a lot of reading <laughs> to go through these and be like, oh, there's the sentence I need to justify this. But I think that's where that strategic element comes in, where you say, well, this is what we want to do. What does the law say about how we should be doing that? And, you know, so it's finding these kind of leveraging, leveraging points and how I'm going to structure out this writing up phase as well about, well, you said this, so why are we not doing that? And it's about actions you know, as a, as opposed to intent in that sense. So there are ways to harness that complexity using the models, you know, doing things like these mapping exercises to see what's come before, that path dependency building upon, you know, things like the Arns Our Future campaign, you know, they've just come out of thin air. So although the implementation's not been as, um, as effective as it maybe wants to have been in this first instance, you can sort of see why that might be the case. But now we have this opportunity to kind of re go back, have a look and then readdress kind of what needs to be in it. And I think as well, you know, when we talk about our and our future and where the where the islands need to go moving forward, I think this governance approach, you know, is probably the more effective one because it allows that flexibility, takes into consideration the context that's required for these policies to be effective, whereas the National Alliance Plan is, you know, a bit more on this policy side, you know, um, rather than this reflexive kind of governance side. And I think 
in all honesty, like I think the National Alliance Plan does a really good job of harnessing that complexity. And when it's come through um, the stakeholder interviews, you know, when they can't add or can't take away anything that's kind of in the National Alliance Plan, you know, the issue is not with the contents of the plan, although they've said it's too broad. If the plan had been there and the implementation had been a bit more effective, you know, would we be seeing the same comments around it being too broad, you know, and nobody was willing to say to add or remove anything from that. So as well as my stakeholder interviews, part of my research is looking at how it's impacted islanders, you know, our day to day lives in our homes. So I did um, a survey between October and December last year, 2023. So, and I aimed this at island, it's all islanders that answered it. And I ran it through things like uh, um, community council groups, community based organisations, um, as well as localised sort of um, groups on social media and um, things like that. So that's how I kind of got the survey out and about. I had 179 responses to the survey. Um, and, you know, not a surprise, right at the beginning of this research, people had no idea what the National Lions plan was. 176 responses there. So people were, you know, 50-50, yeah, kind of know what it is. Um, and then I asked, <laughs> how has the National Lions plan affected you? So people could answer what questions they wanted um, rather than being forced to answer them all. Um, but there you can see, not at all. Um, and in um, I was in a, a meeting yesterday and um, some community groups had asked similar questions of their cohorts that they were dealing with and they had a similar response as well. So it really hasn't reached into the hearts and minds of individual islanders, but I'm not sure policy does that um, if we're looking for a life belt <laughs> in that essence. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting. And then there was space for people to kind of write what they wanted um, in that survey space as well. And, you know, this was kind of typified quite a lot of the comments, um, you know, that really they're not sure what it's done or, you know, it hasn't really addressed anything for them and their experience of being a, an islander. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a glowing review in the survey in that sense. But I think one thing that really has come through over the last couple of years is, you know, people are engaged and, you know, in that meeting yesterday as well, there was 90 people and they were all really wanting to speak about their islands and and you know, the stakeholders that I've spoken to as well, you know, they're passionate. So there is this capacity there in islands. I think that takes me on to this next bit of the next window of opportunity. So here's the multi-streams approach. Um, so what you want really is problems, politics and policies converging together at critical junctures there. And the plan's being reassessed. So that's our window ready. <laughs> and perhaps a model for the future would be something like a a collaborative governance model based around communities um, and really this includes like state agencies like local authorities and or government organizations so it's more of this horizontal approach rather than top down bottom up we don't you know we don't tend to see that well we have still seen it with the national alliance plan but we want to get towards you know people working together where capacity is co-created we have legal but also local leverage points um not just laws, they're just part of the equation. And the legitimacy is developed over time and takes um, account of, you know, context. We have this collaboration, I've spelt strategic wrong. It wouldn't be one of my things if there wasn't a spelling mistake in there. Uh, but it also is this re-evaluation and this ability to utilize local resources here. Um, you know, and this is really great for tackling complex problems, which I hope that I've kind of convinced you that the island issues are complex problems. So this network solution offers an answer to these complex issues. And it's just a very short video from when I was in Shetland over the summer. You know, here's the kind of next iteration as well of, you know, energy developments on islands. You hear the TX in the background of the birds. And I think it's very striking as an outsider to come in and see, you know, there's no houses there. You can't really see people. Um, but there's this issue here. It's very polarizing. Communities haven't got the best deal out of this. There's been some informal policies that really haven't helped um, communities plight. So, you know, we have things that I always call the suggested donation of how many kilowatt hours community gets 
per uh, how many how much money per kilowatt hour community gets from these projects. So I think there's really issues around that that haven't been captured <laughs> by this Islands Act and the National Islands Plan. Um, and also it's not using community networks, it's not using community knowledge, um, and it's not being used to support, you know, service delivery or sustainability on the islands. And it seems like a bit of a sitting duck and a way that we could actually use that market based approach to kind of help things um, along in islands as well. So I think, you know, there is opportunity there and it's across all of the islands, not just Shetland, which you saw in that video as well. So this is where this lovely stakeholder <laughs> model would come into play um, as well, because, you know, these are the groups that kind of work around um, that. So I think that's it, really, um, in terms of my talk. You'll be pleased, Andrew, <laughs> to know. But that just in summary, you know, there's big decisions being made. There's models that we can use to help more efficient implementation of the next iteration, if there's going to be one of the National Islands Plan. Um, there's now some you know, knowledge gathered around how the first one went. Um, it's not not been um, well legitimised by local decision making organisations. Impacts of austerity, we've got com a complexity in there that maybe could be considered more. But the benefits are that it was, you know, developed from this ground up campaign. Islander rights are now enshrined in law. There's policy at, uh, levers there that exist, whether the plan goes ahead or not, that can be used. Um, you know, islands have this path dependency from creating their own governance opportunities around, um, especially around uh, energy transitions. Um, but really, we need to take that first step of improving that social capital, the relationships, the participation and how things are developed in the first place, because I think that's really the step that's been missed um, kind of uh, at the beginning of this implementation. And that would help, I think, um, moving forward into the next one. And we started to see that as local authorities and things have been brought into the fray in the latter years of this iteration. I don't know why that quote just disappeared, but there we go. Um, I like this quote from Rebecca Solnit. Um, she is an academic, but this was not from one of her academic pieces of work. But I like this idea that a free person tells their own story. Um, and the previous quote, oh, there we go, um, was from Professor James Mitchell, who's got a brilliant blog actually about um, some island governance issues. Um, uh, yeah, he does uh, Scottish political commentary um, from a an academic point of view, you know, that actually we've got this point where crises are being used as a reason why these policies have been ineffective. But if they were effective policies that would help, would have helped islands and communities weather the crisis if you view it from the other way around. Um, but that's me, the talking part done. So um, thank you very much for listening and I'll head over to the chat. That's uh, super. Thank you very much, Adele. Lots to unpick there, and uh, I think that's a fantastic quote on the screen as well. Um, just for everyone in the audience, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Adele, please do fire them into the chat. We'll give her a second to catch your breath. And I'm sorry for keeping you late. I see no, you. No, 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 <laughs> we have 10 minutes left. That's Lots of time nice. for questions. I'll maybe um, abuse my position while we're waiting for people to yeah. pop stuff in the chat. Um, you mentioned your your survey. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the responses, was there anything surprising that came out of the survey in terms of people's understanding of the island's plan? Was it the case that um, people maybe weren't aware of the extent of the island's plan and, and the island's act? Or was there actually pretty good knowledge of what it entails and that it just doesn't address the issues that they'd like to see addressed. Yeah, I had to I had to do a few iterations of how I was going to ask questions because it came very clear early on that and I suppose from my own kind of knowledge, you know, people don't really interact with policies in that yeah, way. This is a, Some yeah. people do. You don't go and read it and think, right, how's this going to impact yeah. me? So what I ended up doing was asking directly about the National Alliance plan and actually ended up being really similar to the re-evaluation that the Scottish Government did um, as well, but a slightly different target audience. But what I also asked was how people were participating in like politics in general, were they going to elections? Because I think we talk about governance, we talk about community participation, but if people are just heading off to vote once every five years, you know, is it legitimate to then say that these 
organisations are representative enough. So I think that governmentality comes in with right. that. We're moving a little away from this kind of deferred responsibility where we have the government's kind of um, and, you know, government organisations reflecting our views where actually we want to sort of reflect our own views. So I did a little bit of those kind of inquiries and that tends to be how people are interacting. But I also kind of assessed, you know, how people are approaching volunteering and these kind of things in their communities, because the other thing that's materialised in this research and previous is that a lot of the job roles and things that came out of um, the National Alliance Plan and out of these kind of green projects, you know, they're sort of temp temporary job job contracts. So you can't really build something sustainable yeah. on these things. So there was assessing things like that. So, um, but actually people were quite Im quite impressed with things like health and social care, access to their own cultural heritage and arts that scored like okay. quite highly fine, but things like transport was way down the list. And not, <laughs> not vitriol, but there's this general sense of anger about um, why is more not being done to address mm -hmm. these issues. So it wasn't necessarily the issues themselves, but also, you know, um, what's being done about them and how, how they've gone about it. So there was a lot of comments. I'm still wading through how to analyse all that up. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, but you know, it, it's good that people are, that want to address it. Yeah, they are actively looking to engage. <laughs> yeah, they are, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Louise in the chat. Um, what sort of input response did you have from community owned estate trusts like North Harris Estate, Stornoway Trust, etc.? So I haven't directly from then, and I also didn't ask who it was because I think you have to be quite acutely aware of confidentiality on islands. It's quite easy to infer who's who. I think yeah. what came out uh, looking at how the funding was delivered in the first round and then also um, assessing the kind of community based organisations. The way that the Western Isles, thanks Louise, a little nod there, um, the, the way that the Western Isles community-based organisations structure themselves around opportunities. So in my instance, I was looking at um, the changes to the Marine Scotland Act and the money that's coming through for marine assets through local authorities. So actually the Western Isles local authority keeps the least for itself. <laughs> but the community-based organisations come together and they decide, you know, who's applying for what this year, who's applying for what next year. So suddenly this competitive tendering bid doesn't become competitive because there's this element of collaboration. So I think there's some shared learning and things like that um, that can come from that. But aware, I am aware and have actually visited uh, North Harris on a number of occasions and it still happens everywhere. I worked on some kind of you know, renewable projects as well. There's always these conflicts that arise and who is getting the benefits from these projects. And it's not clear and it's not transparent. And I think particularly in Shetland around Viking, um, and we're talking about offshore things. So some some kind of information has come out through the the interviews that I've done about, you know, new groups or new groups of people are benefiting and old groups of people are losing out. Um, so there's this transition of who's getting what from what, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense, which creates this area of conflict. But this conflict is an opportunity. It's a window for a change. Um, and it, it's always going to happen, but it's how it kind of gets managed um, in that essence as well. So these things do come out <laughs> as we change yeah. um, industries and things like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, Louise just saying thank you very much for that. Um, any other questions for Adele? Might abuse my position again, just while we're in. Um, you mentioned the the Welsh example and how mm -hmm. that is kind of uh, the the kind of template for policy like this. Why is it that the Welsh example is so good? And are there places where uh, the Scottish Islands plan, if we can use that kind of a uh, catch-all term, where it can learn from the Welsh example? Yeah, I think certainly moving forward, I think. I'm not sure, but just kind of looking at the policy landscape and being involved in stuff. And I think what comes up sometimes is, well, how do islands get this and other rural areas when similar things are not getting the same yeah. leverage? There's always that conversation that goes on in the background. So I think there maybe is this risk that some island stuff could be re-rolled back into rural. And I don't necessarily think it's wrong, but I do think that there needs to be this island specific thing as well. Um, and I think that having an islander <laughs> it needs to be an island person with some sort of 
embedded local knowledge. It's difficult to discuss this in words. And I found what I asked in my interview at the end, once we'd done all the official questions, was what does being an islander mean to you? And suddenly, you know, you go from this conversation about things that are happening to um, feeling a certain way in your right. body. So I think there's this element of this kind of, I'm not sure. And this includes people who move to islands, because often we find that people who move to islands do amazing things and they're the ones that help rejuvenate. And, and so I think that I always class those as islanders when they're uh, when they're not sure about answering as an islander. So I think it needs to be somebody who has this sort of embodied awareness of what it's like to be an islander, you know, and we have, you know, we have had that. We have an, a minister who I went to school with, who was in my peer group. He's got island knowledge. A lot of the people I interviewed um, who are delivering out some of the benefits from the National Islands, they're from islands, they're islanders who are working, you know, in the government. So there is this utilisation of island knowledge, but I'm not sure it's being put back into the community. And I just think having somebody that's specifically there to look through an island viewpoint rather than having somebody who thinks something about islands. And I wonder if some of the tools that are being developed now are uh, helping this hands off approach that you can right. sort of say, this is what an island is, tick, tick, tick. OK, yes or no, because a lot of the islands impact assessments, I looked at one actually, you know, about you know, a campus relocating from an island and it said that it would have no impact on an island. And I thought, well, actually, how could that possibly be the truth? So I'm not sure, you know, there's no real kind of judgment for how it's actually reflecting island's decision yeah. making. But somebody looking through that lens specifically on that matter would, you know, they're very focused on what they're having to do. And just even the whole act in general, you know, it's that sustainably wrapped in right there. What are we doing now? How is it going to impact the future? You know, that's... Yeah sustainability and I think it's just a really great a great policy move from Wales it's brilliant okay excellent uh, there's been a last question that snuck through on the chat um oh there are a couple of questions I see everybody's coming in now uh, we've got a question from Ro your thoughts on impact assessment strategy I'm rather cynical about the use of impact assessments from a regeneration perspective you got yes. any thoughts on that you understand and I do think yeah I, uh, you know the legal the legal backup is two things. It's adding capacity to already stretched organisations is one thing. It's another job that they've got to do. And it do, they do have the potential to become this tick box exercise. But I think what we do have as islanders or people who are um, looking to improve, you know, the the sustainability of islands, you know, these are tools that remain there and they will remain there whether the islands plan is there or not because they're associated with the act. So it's, I think it's more about how we frame that opportunity and actually um, the example I use was like the Mull um, Community Development Organisation used the island community impact assessment process to have the ferry operator explain why tickets were costing this and why islanders couldn't. So they have been used to really good effect where they've been taking in this local knowledge to uh, to address a very specific issue within that community. So I think, yeah, they're not perfect, but they're, they are just sort of like a dangling carrot <laughs> that's ready to be used. And it's a legal requirement to respond to that. You know, it's this chain of accountability, um, you know, how, how effective they are, I'm not sure, but that's, you know, that's the one tool that's there to be used, you know, that's kind of a little bit separate from this policy that can change. Um, that you know that have has been used effectively. The other thing is um, the air traffic control. We had this issue in the islands about air traffic controllers being moved onto the mainland and that affecting our service. So the island community impact assessment was used to halt that process. So it has been used to, and just to hold it account. Have you done your islands community impact assessment? What did it show? So you were able then to kind of have something to ask these larger organisations. Well, how have you actually considered islands? Yeah. Um, so they have been used quite effectively to that to that end. Um, regeneration, that's a tough one, because like I said, this kind of ability to acqui acquiesce land, you know, that goes right back to the 1960s. So that's something a lot deeper. And we've just seen, you know, um, forest forestry companies coming to use land and not pay tax. So why are we still doing this? You know, that wasn't on islands, but why are we still doing those things when we have these resources that people can't, you know, well, and there's a remit now in the Marine Scotland Act to conserve, where before you had to have an economic remit uh, as to how you were using an area. So there is a change in, in island-based policy where now you can build up this kind of uh, legitimate reason to conserve areas as well. 
but you know companies should be paying tax and not only that there should be if there's going these developments are going to be going forward you know how can we make sure that policies are supporting islanders to get you know a reasonable compensation and, and that model can be transpired onto other communities um you know that are not island based but maybe islanded in other ways um okay and Awesome. Well, I'm conscious of time, but we do have a couple more questions, so we can uh, address these before we wrap up. Uh, Ryan's asked um, a great presentation. Could you speak more about islands attachment to uh, sorry islands attached to mainland council areas? What are the potential constraints and uh, affordances of this structure? Yeah. So I think like in essence in that one. So there's a really good case study of how North Ayrshire have used. They have a de a development officer who was funded through the program who was really able to pull together a great strategic kind of assessment that islanders have taken forward into their islands to kind of you know help them decide um so when money does come through that they're really able to act on that process really quickly so they have a list of projects how much it's going to cost how long they're going to take and when the opportunity arises boom they can just pounce on it so i think they've done really well in that essence um, I think it's twofold. So I suppose they're even more marginalised islanders in that context, and the whole local authority is not aimed at making decisions about you. Whereas in the island, like in the archipelagos, we only make decisions about islanders and islands. So I think there is that e extra level there. Um, but you know, and there are, you know, like they have whiskey industry, and they're talking about the same things about not being afforded, you know, the benefits of kind of what they are paying into the wider economy and things like that. So. And yeah, and, and they have the same issues, you know, they have uh, second homes, uh, transport on and off the mainland issues, um, housing issues, educational issues, you know, they have all the same problems that we have on Archipelago, so it's not totally different, but I can see how it might be quite different. Um, and also, I meant to say, but didn't, but we don't have time to go into it, but if you want to Google it later on, you know, island local authorities are independent. They're not associated with political parties. So that's the other thing as well. We don't have to tow a party line, which has its pros, it has its pros and it has its cons <laughs> as well. But it's not like you can be whipped into you're supposed to be doing that. And I think that really gives uh, the island councils freedom to kind of, for better or worse, say whatever they think, uh, which is great. You know, which is good. It's free. You're free to do that. Um, and I think, you know, if we were under a different structure, you know, you're just shouting into a noise and you saw those mm. pie charts that islanders associated with mainland local authorities you know you know really are struggling against the kind of scale um in that essence yeah okay super and last but not least we've got a last question from louise um she asks you referenced earlier acts for instance the highlands development act of 1965 do you see comparisons in terms of timescales for positive outcomes from that and the potential for the Islands Act? And perhaps is there a comparison in terms of perceptions or even awareness of people having that that awareness of the impacts looking back? Yeah, I'm not sure about that because some of those compulsory purchase things were kind of embedded in the County Council Acts and they're all for a specific set of time. And I think, I think what gives me a little bit of concern looking back at that is that you know, it's the Secretary of State then that gets to make that decision. Um, but also now we've seen this levering of that Secretary of State position in various decision making things in Scotland in general, like the circular economy thing and Gender Recognition Act. Um, but I think positively what we had at the time of our and our future was we actually had our Orcadian MP <laughs> in that strange Conservative Lib Dem coalition that happened for a short while. He was Secretary of State at that time, so he was able to get the legislation to a very high place in government. There was like an island's desk. So, you know, having somebody, an islander in that role, you know, they were able to play a really key function in some of this coming forward, you know, even now. So it's, you know, it's pros and cons. And it's been really challenging, I must say, because my brain is like, what's the problem? What are the facts? How do we fix it? And everything in this project is entirely constructed um, one way or another. So, um, and we saw it during COVID times, you know, a policy can be three words, not even a whole sentence. So, um, yeah, so it really depends who you have in roles like that. But also, I think there are significant levers that we can use uh, across different organisational types to kind of, you know, push, keep pushing for these kind of changes and you know, 
raising that element of accountability as well because mm -hmm. um, we are responsible if we want to be involved in the decision making to kind of hold that accountability to chain not entirely but at least in part there you go what a note to finish on excellent <laughs> well i'll bring everything to a close just now there's lots of thanks coming in in the chat um but before i do so i'd like to invite everyone to join me in the traditional awkward uh, round of applause, virtual round of applause for Adele, which is really just me looking down the camera. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Adele, for a fantastic paper and for the, the generosity in answering those questions. Here we go, we've got lots of virtual applause joining in. Um, now, before I draw matters to a close, um, fear not, we will be back next month. Uh, the next seminar will be on Wednesday, the 27th of March, and it'll be a very different paper from our very own Dr. Shane McLeod, who will be given a paper entitled Kings on the Move, the Case of the Great Viking Army, so not to be missed. And just a reminder for all news and updates regarding INS, keep your eyes peeled on the website and on our social media pages. But finally, thank you very much again, Adele. Thank you everyone for attending, and we'll see you all next month. Bye for now.